Welcome to the 29th Annual Distinguished Statistician Colloquium, sponsored by Pfizer, ASA, and Yukon. Today, we honor the distinguished career of Dr. James Berger. Please be aware that this program is being filmed and live streamed. We recommend that you confirm that your mobile phone is silenced. Thank you for your attention. Greetings. The Pfizer Colloquium began in 1978 and has been continually supported by funding from Pfizer, the Yukon Department of Statistics, and the American Statistical Association. This joint initiative was started under the leadership of UConn Professor Harry O. Poston and Dr. David S. Salzberg, formerly of Pfizer Global Research and Development. After Professor Poston's death in March 2002 and Dr. Salzberg's retirement from Pfizer, UConn Professor Nidas Mukhopadhyay and Dr. Naiti Ting, then with Pfizer, served as the program's leaders for their respective organizations. Dr. William T. Duggan of Pfizer succeeded Dr. Ting in August 2009. Now, I am delighted to introduce Professor of Statistics, Dr. Joseph Glass. Thank you, Elizabeth. On behalf of our department and the university, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Jim Berger Arts and Science and Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Statistics at Duke to present the lecture entitled Frequencies for Bayesian Adjustment for Multiple Testing under Auspices of the Pfizer Colloquia by Distinguished Statisticians. It's presented in honor of Dr. David S. Dolber. After receiving his PhD in mathematics in 1974 from Cornell University, Jim joined the Department of Statistics at Purdue where during his time there, he was a Richard M. Broomfield Distinguished Professor of Statistics during 1986 and 1997. In 1997, Jim joined the Institute of Statistics and Statistical Sciences at Duke University, where he became later the part of Statistical Sciences as Art and Sciences Distinguished Professor of Statistics. During his time at Duke, he was a founding director of statistics an Applied Mathematics Science Institute, where he served as director between the years of 2000 and 2010. Let me mention some selective professional activities of Jim. Jim served as president of IMS in 1995 to 1996, president of ISBA in 2004. He selected a numerous editorial boards, including associate editor and co-editor of Annals of Statistics and founding co-editor of the journal of the Journal of Uncertainty and Quantification. Jim received many important major awards. Let me mention just a few. He was a fellow of ASA, a fellow of IMS, Guggenheim and Sloan Fellowship, top president's award in 1995. He was elected foreign member of the Spanish Real Academia de Sciences in 2002, and elected to the US National Academy of Sciences in 2003. Jim's research areas include Bayesian statistics, foundation of statistics, decision theory, simulation, model selection, application to many areas of science technology. Last but not least, Jim supervised close to 40 PG dissertations, published close to 200 articles in major journals in statistics, and statistical sciences, the sciences, edited 16 books of special volume. Jim, we are honored to have you here as our speaker today. Congratulations on your great achievement. Uh, th thank you very much, Joe, for that very kind introduction. Um, I have time at 5 o'clock today to give my proper thanks to everybody uh, associated with this. And I don't want to duplicate things. So I'll just start out by saying right now how, how delighted and deeply honored I am to, to have the chance to give this 29th Pfizer uh, uh, colloquium lecture and ensuing discussion. Um, my topic today is, as you see, frequentist and or Bayesian adjustment for multiple testing. Um, the, the background of this is, goes back a, a, a long, long time. It, it starts in 19, I think it was 1983, almost 40 years ago, when I was sitting at a conference somewhere, I can't remember where, 
And next to me was Dennis Lindley. And Dennis Lindley was a very famous, one of the, the most famous uh, uh, Bayesians. Um, and I, I, had, I was kind of a, a fairly new convert to Bayesianism at that time. And we, we heard a talk about multiple comparisons. And I, I, after the talk, which I found interesting, I, but I didn't quite understand it, I, 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 I turned to Dennis and I said, Dennis, do we Bayesians have to worry about multiple comparisons and more generally about multiple testing? And he thought a minute and said, no, we don't have to worry about it. Bayes' theorem takes care of all that automatically. And so I said, okay, good to know. And I never thought about it again for 25 more years. Uh, and then in, in, in uh, you know, the, the early parts of this century, we were doing uh, Bayesian analysis, objective Bayesian. I'm more of an objective Bayesian than a subjective Bayesian, much more. And we were, we were doing uh, objective Bayesian analyses in very large model spaces. You know, so, something like variable selection with 100 variables where there were uh, two to the 100th models. And in Bayesian analysis, you have to assign prior probabilities to models. Uh, and you can't do subjective assignment of two to the 100th models. So we would just do something like saying, okay, all models have equal prior probability. And then we started noticing that we were getting really crappy answers. Uh, the models that were being selected were really large, huge, much, much larger than was reasonable. And so, so then I, I, I dived back into this issue again of do Bayesians have to worry about multiple testing? And it turns out what Dennis was talking about is if you're a true subjective Bayesian and you have elicited all of your subjective prob probabilities appropriately, then you don't have to worry about multiple comparisons. That elicitation will have taken care of the problem. Not so much Bayes' theorem, but that elicitation. However, we were doing objective Bayesian analysis, as, as most people do, and there we discovered, uh-oh, we've been wrong for 25 years. We need to worry a lot about multiple comparison, uh, and, and so we, we figured out uh, how to do the Bayesian adjustment for multiple comparison, and I'll be mentioning that today. Uh, but then at the same time, while I, after we figured that out, I was going, this is so weird because the Bayesian adjustment for multiple comparison is so completely different from the frequentist adjustment. And normally, in these, in these competing statistical inference things, you can kind of figure out how the two relate. But I've actually never been able to figure out how the Bayesian adjustment for multiple testing relates to the frequentist adjustment. And so, and so I'm, I'm, I'm here today just kind of to present my puzzlement to you. Uh, uh, I, will, I will do so, do so through um, uh, uh, five examples. Um, the first one is just an introduction to multiple testing for students. The second one, second one is genome-wide association studies, where, where frequentists and Bayesians both adjust for multiple testing and end up doing so in very similar ways. Then I'll talk about the example of optional stopping, where frequentists adjust but Bayesians do not. Then sequential endpoint testing, where the reverse is true. Bayesians adjust but frequentists do not. And finally, if I have time, I'll talk briefly about subgroup analysis, uh, where both adjust, but how to adjust is complicated. All right, so here, here's just the elementary example to introduce um, uh, uh, multiple testing to those who haven't seen it before. And in a talk I attended a few years ago about the drug development process, the, the following numbers shown here were given in those illustration. Uh, there was 10,000 relevant compounds were screened for biological activity. 500 passed the initial screen and went into in vitro studies. 25 passed that screening, were studied in phase one animal trials, and just one passed that screening and was studied in a phase two human trial. When I saw those numbers, I just started laughing and was wondering if, if this was meant to be a joke uh, because of the fact that 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 this could be nothing but noise if screening meant, as it usually does, uh, being significant at the 0.05 level. I mean, let's just follow it through. Imagine that no compound has any effect. They're all completely useless. No efficacy whatsoever. Well, if I'm testing at the 0.05 level, 10,000 times 0.05 is 500, and they would pass the first screening. Out of those 500, 
0.05 or 25 would pass the next screening. Right? There's, there's nothing going on here. None of these compounds are worth anything. Uh, at, the, at the third phase, you have 25 who were, went to a phase one animal trial. 25 times 0.05 is 1.25, rounded off to one. Uh, that still probably is nothing but noise. It has no efficacy whatsoever. Uh, and, that, and that would go to a phase two trial and would probably fail because it has no efficacy. And that phase two trial is going to cost a lot of money. Now, now the Satra sheet here from Pfizer will, will you know, be the first to tell you this is not the real drug development process. <laughs> if it were, we, we would not have any useful drugs. It's much more sophisticated, much better than that. I'm just talking about, this is a talk I heard about somebody talking about the drug development process. And I've kept the example in mind because it, it's, a, it's a very good illustration of why you have to adjust for multiple testing. And at, at Pfizer, they do a, a very good job of adjusting for multiple testing. Okay, now, now on to my first uh, real example, which is GWAS, Genome-Wide Association Studies. So a, a, a typical um, GWAS study considers K diseases, usually related, like 20, 20 uh, cardiovascular diseases. And then L locations on the genome, and then tests for each disease and each location on the genome. Uh, the null hypothesis is that a disease is not associated with the genome and or that location. And the alternative is that there is an association. So the goal here is to find associations, find out what part of the gene relates to a disease that may uh, down the road lead to some interesting uh, clinical development. So from 1997 to 2007, there were about 50,000 uh, uh, published papers in, in top journals, you know, Nature, Science, uh, uh, all of them, uh, which were claiming that they had found uh, disease gene associations. Um, and they were basically all wrong. Uh, uh, Johnny Anidis, who, who did a study of this, estimated that only 1% of the claimed associations replicated, which is kind of astonishing. And, and the trouble is, is, is that uh, the people who were doing this between 1997 and 2007 did not understand the radical need for adjustment for multiple testing. They were doing a lot of tests. K, K could be, uh, uh, you know, something like 20 often. M could be hundreds of thousands or millions. So they were doing many millions of tests. And they were rejecting with p-values like 0.005. They thought that was pretty strict. But it's not nearly strict enough when you're doing massive multiple testing. Um, in, in 2007, a very nice paper came out by the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, and they said the cutout, cutoff should be 5 times 10 to the minus 7. They had K of 7, they had 7 different um, diseases they were looking at, and 467,000 locations on the genome, so they were looking at a little over 3 million tests. This cutoff worked very well. They found 21 genome disease associations, 20 of which were replicated, so everything looked great using that cutoff. Now, of course, technology has improved. There's many more places on the genes looked at these days, many more diseases. So this cutoff in GWAS studies has gone lower and lower and lower. I think it's something like 10 to the minus 10th today. Uh, you have to have a p-value. For, for each test, you have to have a p-value less than 10 to the minus 10th before you can, you can declare that there is an association. All right, now, um, let's, let's talk about possible corrections for multiple testing, and there's two types here. Um, there's strong error control, where, where essentially you don't want to make any, you don't want any of your rejections to be wrong, or at most 5% of them or something. Uh, no, you're, you, sorry, you don't want any rejection to be wrong with probability 0.95. So the, the standard frequentist solution to that is the Bonferroni correction. Uh, if I'm conducting M independent tests and I want the probability of any incorrect rejection to be less than 0.05, then each individual test, you, Bonferroni says, conduct at level 0.05 divided by M. Uh, in the GWAS example, uh, 
0.05 divided by m would have been 1.5 times 10 to the minus eighth, which is, which is smaller than, than uh, what, what they recommended. And, and the reason for that, in a sense, is that Bonferroni, uh, this, this Bonferroni adjustment, it works for dependent or independent tests, but it's, it's only kind of fully powered for independent tests. And if the tests are dependent, it's too strict and you want to use a smaller value than this, depending on the amount of dependency between the tests. And uh, all of these um, many, many millions of tests are being done based on the same data. So the test statistics are dependent. So it turned out that this lower p-value was suitable because of uh, the dependence. Okay, so that's, that's the, the frequentist solution. Now, the Bayesian solution is something just completely different. Um, uh, let pi 1 denote the prior probability of a disease, of a disease gene association. Okay, so I, I, I just uh, specify what is the probability that we'll, we'll reject. What is the probability of an alternative hypothesis? And I'm calling it pi 1. And then the Bayesian uh, simply assumes pi 1 is unknown and conducts a Bayesian analysis. Uh, now, an objective Bayesian might assign pi 1 a uniform distribution on 0 to 1. Uh, and a subjective Bayesian might choose a prior distribution to reflect beliefs on the plausibility of a disease gene association. Uh, in either case, the posterior distribution of pi 1 will concentrate on very small value. So, pi 1 will, when you do the analysis of all of the GWAS data, uh, you know, the, the uh, posterior mean of pi 1 might be something like uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 7th. The prior probability will end up being very low of a disease gene association. And so, because the prior probability is very low, the posterior probability will be very low. So now, now the, the oddity here is that the Bayesian analysis is just operating in a completely different space. It's operating in the prior probability space of hypotheses, in this case of a, of a disease gene association, where the frequent solution is operating in the, in the, in the pulse data sphere of tests and p-values. Notice, notice the Bayesian analysis, I never mentioned data. It doesn't matter what the data is. It doesn't matter if the data comes from independent tests, dependent tests. It doesn't matter. The Bayesian analysis is the same. Uh, at this point, Bayes' theorem will sort everything out. And if it's dependent, it will, it will end up with a more favorable value of pi 1. If it's independent, it will be less favorable, like the Bonferroni example. Uh, and it has been observed in quite a few examples that both the frequentist and the Bayesian solutions here provide very strong error control, more or less equivalently strong error control. The Bayesian error control might even be slightly stronger than the Bonferroni correction error control. Um, why I like the Bayesian solution is because it doesn't depend on the structure of the data. Uh, and, and simply saying, here's how you adjust for multiplicity, uh, so that, that it handles, whether it's dependent or independent, it's kind of, in, in, in some sense, optimally powered. So you get optimally power, optimal power also, always, while maintaining strong error control. All right, that's one type of, of, of multiple testing typ typically done. Another one is um, uh, uh, trying to control the proportion of true rejections to false rejections. A frequent solution here is the false discovery rate, which I'm not, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but let me just say what the, the Bayesian solution is. And this was, the Bayes, this was actually the Bayesian solution chosen in the Nature paper. And they used what I would call a pre-experimental version of Bayes' theorem. So uh, of one, a, a, a version of Bayes' theorem in terms of odds says that the odds of a correct rejection to an incorrect rejection is equal to the prior odds of the alternative to the null times... 1 minus power uh, divided by type 1 error. Now, that's just before you do the experiment, if you write down 
what Bayes' theorem is and convert it to odds, that's, that's, what, you, that's what you find. Uh, in the GWAS studies, they said the average power was about 0.5, uh, and alpha is the desired type 1 error cutoff, uh, which, which is 0.05 in their study. Uh, so now the, 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 the trick here is you have, to do some, you have to do the Bayesian multiplicity correction by bringing it into the prior probabilities. They brought it into the question of the prior odds of the alternative to the null. The prior odds of an association to no association. And they estimated that to be one over 100,000. I mean, they, they just got a lot of geneticists, medical people, biologists together at a big think tank about how, how likely is it for a particular disease to actually be associated with a particular gene. And they, and they came up with one over 100,000. Okay, so then just solving this Bayes theorem here, we plug these numbers in. Uh, oh, 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 and, and, and they wanted the prior odds to be 10 to 1. So they, just, they, they, they decided that out of all their rejections, if 90% of their rejections are correct, they'd be happy. They're balancing two things off. They, you know, they, 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 when, you, when you do one of these things and you, and you find a rejection, that's not the end of the story. You have to go out and do further studies. So, so the, the danger of having an incorrect rejection is simply that on, on the ones that you incorrectly reject, you will go out and spend money doing further studies before you find out they don't work. And they decided that having a 10 to 1 uh, uh, odds of correct to incorrect rejections was a good balancing between the, the, the risks associated with each action. Um, Curiously, uh, this Nature article, I loved it because they clearly had pure Bayesians in it and, and, and not complete non-Bayesians and people who were kind of in between. And they all settled on this kind of compromised pre-experimental Bayes thing because it involved power and type 1 error and made the non-Bayesians happy. Uh, and it involved prior odds, which made the Bayesians happy. But, but the real Bayesians uh, said, no, 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 the, thing, the right thing to do is to use the version of Bayes' theorem that's post-data, where, where you, you say the odds of correct rejection to incorrect rejection, given the data x, uh, is, again, the prior odds. But instead of, of power over type 1 error, you put in the Bayes factor of h1 to h0, which I'm, I'm not going to define here, but it's a, a well-known quantity, like a likelihood ratio. Um, and these posterior odds range between 1 over 10 and 10 to the 68th for the claimed associations. And the, the Bayesians had to kind of hide these numbers in footnotes. It was kind of funny. Um, now the, the, the curiosity here was that one of the associations had, had uh, uh, data-dependent odds of 1 to 10. That's going the opposite way. That's a, saying it's 10 times as likely that there's no association that there being an association. Remember I said that, uh, um, where did I say this? They found 21 genome disease associations and 20 were replicated. The one that wasn't replicated was the one where the data-dependent posterior odds went the other direction. All right, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because I'm not, I don't have enough time. Or, I mean, I'm talking too, I'm talking too much. Uh, uh, okay, now let's, let's switch, switch gears to optional stopping. So this is the example where frequentists adjust for multiple testing and Bayesians do not. So the, the tradition in some sciences is to ignore optional stopping. If one is close, this is especially true in social sciences many social sciences. If one is like psychology, I mean, psychology, uh, I, I, I have many, many conversations with editors of psychology journals and things like that about what to do about this problem. If, if one is close to P equals 0.05, you go out and get more data. So, so here's, here's a typical example. Uh, suppose one has, is testing whether a normal mean is zero. Um, okay, we're, we're assuming that, that the null hypothesis is true the normal mean is zero, so, so there's nothing going on, okay? no effect. Uh, we've conducted a test with a sample size of 100. 
we happened to have obtained a p-value p equals 0 0.08. So now what is commonly done in some fields is to say, well, I just didn't pick a large enough sample size. So let me go out and get some more data. So, so, so let's imagine that you decide you could get another 100 observations, but you're going to break it up and do it in stages. And in fact, you're going to do four different stages where you'll go out and get 25 more observations, then evaluate, then go out and get another 25, then evaluate, and so forth. Um, but the trick is, uh, you are only going to rep report the final p-value if it's less than 0.05, and then you'll stop collecting the data. And you'll report that p-value and the combined sample size, and you won't say that you did this, that you went out and tried one time after the other. Uh, an easy computation shows that the chance of driving the p-value below, below 0.05 is actually two-thirds with this strategy, just by random chance. You can drive it. There, there's, not, there's no the null hypothesis is true here, so there's no, there's no effect. But just by random chance, if you adopt this strategy, you can, defy, you can drive that p-value below 0.05 with, with probability two-thirds. Um, if one kept on doing this forever, the, 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 the probability that you can drive the p-value below 0.05, of course, goes to one. This is kind of a well-known uh, property of, of p-values. So virtually all statisticians and many scientists find this unacceptable. They would say, no, you have to report that you did this optional stopping, that you collected the data in stages. And once you report that, you can correct for the multiple testing and come up with a right adjusted p-value. Okay. Um, now let's, let's go to the Bayesian side. Uh, okay. Curiosity. A Bayesian analysis does not correct for optional stopping. It just doesn't. If you, if you write down the stopping rule and you put it in Bayes' theorem, it's in the numerator and the denominator, it's only a function of x, and it cancels. So Bayesians ignore optional stopping, uh, which, which, you know, some people think is terrible. Um, uh, uh, um, but let, let's, let's talk about it. So let, let's imagine that the same thing is going on, but we're doing a Bayesian analysis instead. We've taken the first 100 observations, and we compute that the posterior probability of the null hypothesis is 0 0.08. We, we can only publish if, we're, if we get a posterior probability below 0 0.05, so we'll try to do this same trick of taking additional samples of size 25, hoping that we can drive the posterior probability uh, below 0.05. Okay. It, you, you actually can't really do that. If, if you do this, this repetitive sampling uh, and see how low you can drive the posterior probability, the chance that you get it below 0.05 is only 0.215. With the, with the frequentist using the p-value in this strategy, you could drive it below 0.05 with probability two-thirds. But here, the probability you can drive it below 0.05 is quite small. And, and in fact, if you, if you take repeated samples, uh, whereas the p-value went to one, uh, here the posterior probability of the data goes to one. So you become convinced the null hypothesis is true. So, so I mean, this is not definitive, but this is just showing that, that um, uh, the same strategy that the, the optional stopping people can try to use to fool uh, frequentists, when you try to apply that strategy to try to fool Bayesians, it doesn't work. You, you can't fool them by using this optional stopping strategy. But, but still, this is one of the most interesting and, and long-term controversial things in statistics. You know, there's two competing intuitions here. Intuition one says it is wrong to give the investigator multiple tries to prove something and not reveal that this was done. That's like cheating. Uh, the intuition on the other side says, look, the data is the data. Who cares what the investigator was thinking about the data? Uh, we should just report what the data says. And that's, that's the, the, called the stopping rule principle. And was espoused in, like, I think, 1948 by George Barnard. Here's, here's one of my favorite examples of 
uh, of, of the conflict between these two intuitions. Um, so two collaborators are monitoring a graduate student who is conducting an experiment, and the observations are either success or failure. Okay. Nine successes and four failures have been observed, and the collaborators look at each other and nod their head, and they both agree they have enough data, and it's time to stop the experiment. They go ahead and do their, they separate, they, they separate and go and do their analyses, uh, come back together, and they discover that they have different answers. Uh, the, the, the first collaborator had planned to stop the experiment after four failures, which occurred, but that means he was doing a negative binomial experiment uh, with four failures. And if you compute a p-value for that, uh, you find that the data is significant. The other experimenter was just planning to take 13 observations all along. So that ex experimenter was doing a binomial uh, uh, experiment with um, 13 observations. And if you compute the p-value for that, it turns out to be bigger than 0.05, something like 0 0.08. So, so uh, what this is emphasizing is that the difference between these two conclusions, significance and not significance, have nothing to do with the data, nothing to do with the experiment. They only have to do with thoughts that were in the experimenter's heads while the data was being collected. And, and so that's, that's the example supporting intuition two. Uh, I love Jimmy Savage's quote, uh, quote about this, said, uh, when I first heard the stopping rule principle from Barnard in the early 50s, uh, I thought it was scandalous that anyone in the profession could espouse a principle so obviously wrong, even as today I find it scandalous that anyone could deny a principle so obviously right. So this is a, this is a great example of competing philosophies and intuition. Um, no, I, I mean, there's, there's... Do I have any more to say about this? No. no there's nothing wrong here. I mean, I mean... Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with anybody here. The frequentists are right when they're using p-values to adjust for optional stopping. The Bayesians are right uh, uh, when using Bayesian analysis not to adjust for optional stopping. They're both right. They're both doing the right thing within their own sphere. Uh, and, and again, they'll often get very similar answers. But I, I, don't, know I don't know why. It's you know, completely different logic. I don't quite know when I started. When did I start? Um, well, let's, let's go back to the schedule and see when I should have started. <laughs> I'll get us back on schedule by doing that. I was supposed to start at 3.06, and I'm supposed to be done at 3.46. All right, I'll bring us back on schedule and be done by 3.46. <laughs> uh, but, but I do have then a, 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 a time, to go through this, time to go through this example, which, which is uh, um, the opposite type of example. Here, um, frequentists do multiple testing but do not adjust, and here Bayesians uh, would adjust. So sequential, sequential endpoint testing is very, is very popular, in, in, in especially in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, what it deals with is you have a sequence of null and alternative hypotheses. Um, Here's my first test, null and alternative, my second test, null and alternative, and so forth. And these are going to be tested sequentially. First, this one's going to be tested, then maybe this one will be tested, and so forth. The ordering of the hypotheses is important and must be pre-specified. Uh, so here's, here's an, an example. Uh, there could be a new drug that's being tested, and the, the first hypothesis, the first alternative could be the new drug provides pain relief, with the corresponding null being it doesn't provide pain relief. Um, the uh, second hypothesis could be this same identical drug reduces blood pressure. Uh, and the third alternative hypothesis could be the same drug promotes weight loss. So these, these are different endpoints. This would be endpoint one, this would be endpoint two, this would be endpoint three. Uh, and and the, the, the same nominal type 1 error alpha is chosen for each test. So we're just going to do, if we do, well, we are going to do H1, and we'll do it at, at level alpha, 
If we do H2, we'll do, do it at level alpha. And if we do H3, we'll do it at level, level alpha. 0.05, same. But, but the, the, the kicker here is that there's a specific sequential process that you have to follow. So you conduct the first test, and if you do not reject the first test, that's it. You're done. No more testing. If you do reject the first test, you're allowed to go on and perform the test for the second endpoint. If that does not reject, again, you have to stop. But if that rejects, you can go on and do the test for the third endpoint. And in this case, you're done because uh, that's, that's all the, all the, all the uh, endpoints you have. But in principle, you could do this with M different endpoints and, and sequentially do these series of tests one after another. Okay. Now, remember, each of these M tests, if they're performed, is, is conducted with the same error probability, like 0.05. And the rather interesting, when I first saw it, I found it amazing, frequentist fact, is that the probability of one or more false re rejections is less than or equal to alpha, 0.05, no matter which null or alternative hypotheses are true. So, so what, what's surprising about this is, that, I mean, you, you know, if you're doing M tests and you did them all, if you did them all simultaneously, then you'd have to, uh, and you wanted overall control of alpha, then you'd have to do Bonferroni, and you'd have to do each individual test at alpha over M. Here, you could be doing M tests, and there's no apparent control. You, you do them all at the 0.05 level, and you end up concluding that 0.05 is the overall probability that you've made one or more errors. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, the, the, uh, uh, I'm not going to do a full Bayesian analysis of this problem because it gets pretty complicated. But, but let me just say that this is not compatible with Bayesian reasoning. I mean, if, 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 I, if I'm doing a Bayesian analysis and I just did the first test, I, I would have the posterior probability of H1 given the data. And, and uh, you know, that's some number. Let's say it's 0.05. Okay, so I, I can reject. Uh, if I go on to the second test and I ask what's the posterior probability of, of, uh, H, of, the, of the alternatives for H1 and H2 given the data, well, that, that has to be smaller than 0.05. It has to go down. If I, if I, if I do this and have, have done it for a series of 10 tests, this posterior probability will be near zero. So, so the Bayesian is saying, look, it, you're still doing multiple testing. You still should be penalized. Uh, and, and, and the Bayesian will provide a penalty. So, so th this is, a, this is a, 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 a very interesting example um, uh, of uh, that, that's, that um, I've, I've had, I've, I've had uh, unending arguments about this with my friends in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, which of, which of course are quite happy to be able to, to say that the drug works on three multiple endpoints. Um, okay, my last example uh, was subgroup analysis. Um, well, okay, I'm, I'm not... I'm not I'm, let, let me just describe the, the, the problem for those who haven't seen subgroup analysis, because I... I find it kind of fascinating. So here's a study done a number of years ago where uh, aspirin is really good for cardiovascular diseases. And, and somebody tried to see if adding a drug called lapidogrel together with aspirin would do, would do better in the prevention of, of uh, whatever that word is, events. Um, and then in the conclusion of the article, they had this very strange statement saying there was a suggestion of benefit with clop clopidogrel treatment in patients of a certain type and a second and a suggestion of harm in patients of another type. 
Very strange conclusion. How did, how did this happen? Well, sort of, sort of here is the data presented as it often is in, in, uh, in terms of hazard ratios. Uh, and this is hazard ratio for various cardio, cardiovascular diseases. And so a hazard ratio of one means nothing's going on. And, and if the hazard ratio is less than one, one, you can draw one conclusion. If it's bigger than one, you draw another. Uh, and so what's, what's desired is, is to have the hazard ratio less than one or bigger than one. But confidence intervals are given for, for each of the hazard ratios. And you have to have the, the I think there are 95% confidence interval. And you have to have the 95% confidence interval either to the right of one or to the left of one before you can say anything useful. Overall, all down at the bottom here is all patients, and overall the confidence interval uh, did, was not to the left of one, so they could not make an overall conclusion that there was a benefit. I can still see my computer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shan't go through the rest of this example, and I'll, I'll just tell you my, my final thought. Um, oh, we're back? All right. Then I will go through it. It's just, it's just kind of amusing. So, so then they started looking at subgroups. Okay? First, they looked at age. Uh, under 75 or over 75? Nope. The confidence intervals cross one. Sex, female, male? Nope. Diabetes? Nope. Smoking? Nope. Body mass, aha, here's something interesting happened. The normal body mass, no, no evidence of an effect. Overweight, the confidence interval is to the left. Is there an effect for overweight people? I'm sure they would, they would have been interested in claiming it, but then they noticed that for obese people, it seemed to go the other way. And, and they couldn't think of any biological reason why that would be the case, so they forgot about it. Moved on. And finally, when they got down to uh, uh, something called inclusion group, which is the symptoms they exhibited, they found an interval to the left. And they wanted to claim that that was an effect. But the, the journal wouldn't let them because they were doing 26 tests and they were not adjusting for multiple tests. Anyway, uh, I won't tell you how frequentists and Bayesians would treat this, but it's the same thing, uh, trying to adjust error probabilities on the one side and dealing with prior probabilities on, on the other side. Uh, Chao Xing was actually worked on this problem as part of his thesis. So my, my final thoughts is that typical multiple testing needs adjustment from either frequentist or Bayesian reasonings. They approach it from entirely different directions, and I don't quite understand how they can approach it from these completely different directions, and most of the time get this, the, the same answer. Optional stopping is contentious. Uh, frequent sequential endpoint testing seems wrong to me as a Bayesian. Um, and, and, and finally, I just want to es es estimate that, again, the Bayesian approach to all of these multiple testing problems seems to have strong control and is fully powered, which is the reason why I tend to like it. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, at this point, we have time for one or two brief questions. Uh, please, if you have a question, make sure you have the microphone. Students will be walking around, or they should be walking around to help you with it. Anybody have any questions? No questions. It's very brief. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> no questions. Opinions of that sort, where you know, subjective and objective Bayesians would 
have uh, the same maybe conclusion with accumulating evidence. Now we are, we are in a different era where we have big data, right? And uh, even whether it is frequentist or Bayesian, people are actually staying away from the traditional inference framework. So do you think we should still keep talking about this difference between Bayesian and frequentist in the era of big data? Thank you. Interesting, interesting, very interesting question. The, I mean, I have two answers to that. One, one, one is that we are in an era of big data, but, but the traditional statistics problems have not disappeared. I mean, I mean, I, when, when, you, when one is doing, doing a, a, um, a GWAS study, you, you maybe are looking at millions of genes, but you're still only looking at 50 patients. You know, the, the, the real sample size is the number of patients, and that remains small. And, and so, and so we, 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 because of the fact that in, 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 in many times in traditional statistics, we have relatively small sample sizes, it's not really an error of big data. There are different problems, um, you know, stuff coming from the internet like that, that are different, that are truly big data. But I, I, I don't think the bulk of statisticians will ever be doing that. Many will be, but we'll still be doing our traditional stuff. Um, my second answer to that is, is, that, is that, yes, I, I mean, I, I think the, the uh, 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 in this area, area of big data, um, uh, well, one, one way I think of it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. And we need to bring some law and order to it. And, and we statisticians can bring some law and order to it by bringing our principles into the wild, wild west of data science. So it, this is a question for um, David Grubin, and he first said, thank you, Professor Berger, for your talk. So his question was that frequentists, when they have a like, comp complicated test other than von Ferenyi correction and stuff, don't quite know how to adjust confidence intervals. Do Bayesians know how to adjust the HPDs? Um. Yes, that's that's another thing I I I I I haven't I didn't focus on. So I mean, it, I I mentioned that that Bayesian analyses are kind of always automatically fully powered, and and there's a lot of work on the frequentist side to to get optimal power also in, in questions like uh, dependent test statistics. Um, uh, but it's hard work, really hard work, especially in complicated problems. Uh, so, so I think that when you get to a complicated problem with lots of dependence going on, it's actually much, much easier to do to adjust for multiplicity using the Bayesian side than to figure out how to do it on the frequent side. That's not, I'm not sure that's the right answer. I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's the answer to the question that was asked, but it's an answer to some question. <laughs> that was uh, great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Fantastic. At this time, uh, we would like to present a warm message of congratulations from the Executive Director of the American Statistical Association, uh, Dr. Ron Wasserstein. Jim, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the American Statistical Association, I congratulate you on this recognition and thank you for your wonderful address. The ASA is a longtime supporter of this colloquium and I've been personally involved for many years. It is a real privilege and it's a great honor to be in the same room as it were with the great colleagues such as Jim that are recognized through this program. You often hear it said that someone needs no introduction. That's truly the case with Jim. He is one of the most well-known statisticians of our time and objectively the most famous Bayesian. The total quantity of his research has to be expressed in logarithms. He has spoken in nearly as many countries as Antonio Guterres. He has to be the most organized person you know because he has been on the organizing committee of at least 50 conferences. I am grateful for the opportunity to congratulate you, Jim, and to thank you for all the ways you have been supportive of me over the years. 
And many thanks to all who have made this colloquium possible. We are so grateful for the long-standing support of Ron and the ASA. Uh, now we have someone else who'd like to share some words of congratulations on behalf of Pfizer. I invite Dr. Shat Satrajit Roy Chowdhury to the stage. Thank you. My name is Satrajit Roy Chaudhary. I'm a member of the Statistical Research and Innovation Group in Pfizer. On behalf of Pfizer, it's a great, great pleasure to congratulate Dr. Berger on, uh, and uh, one of the renowned leaders that I know, basically, in, 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 the, in the recent era of statistics. The first time I was familiar with Jim was the first course of, of my decision theory in MSTAT in ISI second year. I did very bad on the course, but the book still stayed with me, and I still use it quite a, quite a while. And so, I mean, Pfizer. Also, we are, we are also very proud to be part of this colloquium, which is a distinct 29 distinguished colloquium in collaboration with University of Connecticut as well as ASA. And this can, this this colloquium has featured many distinguished scientists and statistician over the years. It's been a, and Pfizer has always been a proponent of innovative methods, research methodologies, and we are, um, that, that's, that's core of our values, and we always very much value training of the students, which is reflected, statistical student for the next generation, reflected via our fellowship, as well as our internship programs. And UConn, we are also very happy to start our first year fellowship program with UConn this year as well. And on, there's, there's needless to say about Dr. Berger. I mean, there, as, as Ron says, somebody who doesn't need any introduction. I just wanted to say that how you impact us as a statistically. We, so Bayesian statistics, been, been one of the Bayesian statistician in pharma. Now there are a lot, but at very few years ago, we were being pretty prohibited to use the word, but it's now become common culture. In Pfizer, we are proud to say in the early phase study, studies, Bayesian methodology becomes a part, integral part of the decision making. Going into the, into, the, into the next, in the confirmatory stage, though we still dominated by frequentist, there are a lot of Bayesian statistics being used. One of the example is a COVID vaccine trial, also a lot of pediatric where we try to use adult data in order to use on a population where it's hard to recruit. And thank you for your enormous and work and been especially bringing this concept, bringing all this work that you bring in the idea of errors and looking into this false, risk where Bayesians often used to say they don't need to look into type one error. They don't look into this. Being, at least having those discussion helped us to put Bayesian into a regulatory context, which is a bread of butter work for us. So at this point, I would really like to thank again, Dr. Berger for his monumental work in the field of statistics, which actually fosters our decision making and leading this path on the way. And I'm sure there are many, many more to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chowdhury. Uh, at this point, uh, we will take a 10 minute break and begin promptly at 4.10. Um, with the interview portion of the program. Enjoy refreshments and restrooms. Thank you.